Hey guys, welcome back to the Blade Shop. Thanks for being here. Today I'm going to take you along as I put handles on these knives. So let's get into it. These are full tang knives as you can see and to this point they're the blade is finished, they're hand sanded, they have my logo, my maker's mark etched on them and now it is time to Oh, I have to re-sand that because I put them all together and scratched that. See? Not good. Okay. Well, let me touch those up. The reason I don't tape all the way up there is because the handle skill is going to come up to right around here and, and the tape gets in the way. But obviously you have to be careful to not do what I just did there and put little scratches on it. That'll come right out so it's not an issue. We're going to put handle skills on these epoxy uh, rivets or pins as the case may be and it's going to look something like this one when we're finished. Obviously this one is ready to be uh, finished and shaped and we won't be doing that today on these because the epoxy needs time to cure. Okay, so we have our knife. This particular one is a nice little four inch uh, Nesmux style blade custom order. It's an 01 tool steel so it'll be a great little blade. And in this case, the handle material is natural canvas micarta with orange G10 liners. So this is a good opportunity actually because I'll be able to show you how I do liners <clears throat> as well. I don't do a lot of liners, but it'll be nice to put that in this video. So the first thing I'm going to do is take my handle material. And these particular sheets that I get are, I think it's 5 inches by 10 inches and five inches is plenty big for almost every knife handle. You're really gonna be closer to four inches to four and a half inches on the finished length of the handle scales themselves. But I like to give myself plenty of extra, so I'll bring the edge up all the way to almost the plunge line on the blade. And of course, there's extra down here. So I'm just gonna hold this in place and mark my tang um, I'll, I usually either do this with a marker or depending on the material I'll use a scribe and I sometimes will clamp the blade down and scribe a nice heavy line that works pretty good. Now I'm going to flip the tang over opposite to the first one. Now that's important because you're making a, you're making a handle scale for two different sides for each side so they need to reflect that. Now the way I'm doing this this is going to be the outside of each scale, so the marker is on the outside of the scale. And as you can see, we're, we'll cut this in half and these will fold down essentially right here on the tang, and that's how they're going to go. So it's just an easy way to do this because you don't have to, uh, you know, try to remember which direction the tang goes and which side is which because the marker is always on the outside. This is going to go on the outside. Um, like so when we're finished but before we do that all our operations are going to be our drilling operations are going to be on the outside of the tank so let's do that next now most of the time my preferred method is to use the tang that the handle skills are going to be fitted to as the template for drilling them so that just means that I'm going to clamp this knife tang to the to the handle material and then I'm going to take it over to the drill press and use these holes with the appropriate or the same size drill bit that drilled these holes in the tang and drill them into the handle skills and that's going to ensure that the holes are going to be exactly where they need to be. Now since we're doing liners we need to go ahead and cover that. Okay so the important thing to remember on, on these is that just like the handle skills, they have to be orient they have to be indexed um, on the same side. When you once you drill the holes, they have to stay on those sides, otherwise they're not going to line up perfectly. Or I should say they have to be turned the right direction. And the way I'm going to do that is simply by putting uh, these liners on the uh, back side of this handle material, and then I'm going to clamp the tang right here. And so I'm going to drill one side of the handle scales and the liners, both the liners, at the same time. And then I'll switch over to the other side of the handle scale. And so you can see that you have to make sure 
that the handle material is covering adequately the tang area. So if you if you have your hand, or excuse me, the, the liner material, if you have it too far over the side or something and you know the tang's hanging off, you, get, you can't have that. So it has to be, it has to be adequately covering that. So ch make sure you check that from the back side. The reason I'm clamping this too, you could just clamp the tang and then I have to write to these and that works too, but this is kind of flimsy and so I find it just works better to have a, a thicker, heavier, you know, set up here all together to, to do that. So let's go over to the drill press. Okay, I have all the handle holes or the the bolt holes drilled in the handle material and in the liners, and you can tell from the orientation or the the, the spot that the lanyard hole is in, you can tell which way these go, at least up and down. Obviously, this is the spine or top side of the handle, and this is the the bottom of it, just based on that. But I also want to I want to mark these. Um, as to left and right. I want to be able to, to uh, put these on the, the proper side and that's specifically once I put this all together and uh, pre-shape the front end of the handle scales. And the reason for that is even just a tiny tiny bit of angle on that handle scale material and liners that are going to be right here on the on the blade. Even a tiny tiny bit of angle will show up if you, if, for example, if you swap uh, the liners from one side to the other instead of on the side that they were when you shaped that. And I'll, I'll explain that more as we get into it. But for now, I need to go ahead and cut this in half. And um, well, first we can go ahead and countersink these actually. Um, I'm doing handle bolts on this Corby bolts. And so these need countersunk obviously for the bolt head to sit down in the handle material about halfway. So I'm going to pull out my uh, countersink drill and we'll go ahead and do that real quick. So this countersink drill is about $20. I get it from Jantz or KnifeMaking.com. And it's uh, machined specifically for the Corby bolts that I'm using. It has a 5 16 um, diameter at the top end. That's a 5 16 head on the Corby bolt. And then this is about 7 30 seconds right here. Um, and so it, it just makes it a lot easier. You could you could get a 5 16 drill bit and grind it down to make your own countersink and uh, that can be done but I've, <clears throat> I just find it's a lot easier to to buy one of these and use it if you're doing a lot of them which I do so that's what I'm going to be using. So what I'm trying to accomplish here obviously is put a larger diameter countersink down here for the bolt head to fit into and that shoulder right there obviously is what provides that strong mechanical lock if you will once we tighten those bolts down and that in conjunction with the epoxy that we'll use makes a very very durable very strong handle construction. Now obviously you want a good balance between leaving enough material on the bolt head which is determined by the depth of this first larger diameter. You want a good balance between that and the material that's left on the handle scale and that's the the rest of that or the smaller diameter down in there. And usually on the on this uh, this material is slightly over a quarter inch thickness. I usually go for about half and half uh, because you don't want a really thin bolt head but you also don't want a really thin a uh, bit of material left for that bolt to grab onto because then it, even if the bolt's strong the handle material could potentially fail under extreme conditions and so that's what I'm going for is about half and half in this case. Once I feel for where the first depth is I'll go ahead and set that <clears throat> with the uh, with the depth stop on the drill press here and I just makes it real quick and simple to go to go countersink the other three holes real fast or 
or more holes than that, depending on how many knives you're doing at one time. So at this point we're ready to tie this whole setup together with some bolts and go to the next step, almost. I will point out that in this case, while it's easy to index the liner material in the right spot or the right direction because of that lanyard hole that's offset, uh, that's not always the case. For example, if that lanyard hole wasn't there, it'd be very difficult to know if these liners were, you know, upside down or not, and it does make a difference. And so in those cases, I will often take just a hacksaw and cut just a little notch on the on the bottom side of the handle so I know which way to index those and it just makes it a lot, a lot easier. Before I tie these together with the bolt, I'm gonna go ahead and clean off the, you know, the, the little bit sticky stuff and just and get that slick finish off of there so that when we do go to glue or epoxy these together, it's got a lot, it's got a lot better bonding uh, surface and that's the same with, with the uh, G10 here as well. So let's go to the grinder and take care of that. Okay, so we have stainless steel Corby bolts, which are the only kind of Corby bolts that I use anymore because I find the brass and I'm sure the copper is too, just far too weak. And, and the weak spot on the Corby bolt is this right here. Um, you know, if, if the diameter of this little uh, thread rod was the same width uh, as the thread itself on the outside diameter, it might be a little better, but you know the the machining process. They turn this diameter down smaller to make to have a relief um, spot for the threads when you're cutting threads on something, and so that's the weak spot on the Corby bolt. And I just find that on brass and I'm sure copper as well, they just the, those metals just don't have enough strength to um, to, to hold together. For, I mean, I have twisted off many cor many brass, multiple brass Corby bolts just hand tightening with a screwdriver and, and trying to be careful. Um, but you know, I want, I want them to be tight and I've never, never had that happen with a stainless Corby bolt. So they're obviously much stronger. And the nice thing is, you know, on, on the handle on a knife, you're holding onto it and the salts and the oils from your hand is going to, you know, at the very least put a patina on whatever pin or bolt material <coughs> you're using. And it's, you know, and depending on the environment, you know, can corrode it a little bit. Which on brass, you know, it puts a patina on it and it's kind of a nice look generally. Uh, but if that was ever a concern, then, you know, stainless steel doesn't do that, so it's kind of nice in that respect as well. So I'm just tightening these, tightening these down snug, not super tight, but we want the handle material to be um, held together tightly, if at all possible, and uh, we're going to grind, sand, and, and, and polish the front edge or the front end of these handle scales prior to putting it on the knife because obviously that's not accessible after it's on the knife without you know scratching up the, the blade the tang it just would not you there's no way to finish that so we're going to do that next Thank you. 
Okay, so I have this sanded down to, I think it's, well, it's 600 grit on this one. And you can go to whatever grit you need to go to for the finishing um, touch on your handle skills, because obviously this needs to be done before it goes on the knife. And the reason I took the bolt out after I put it in the vise, that's crucial after you put it in the vise, to make sure everything's still indexed properly, is because using the uh, sandpaper like like this and the sort of the shoe shine technique uh, you can't get all the way around this radius with that bolt in the way I found so I just do it this way take it out then I can get everything all the way finished and uh, then we can once we find it finish the final handle we'll do a nice transition obviously into the rest of the handle material surface all right we are ready to put this handle on you can see that I went and ground off the tang for a good clean surface for our epoxy to bond to. I also cleaned it off with a um, cleaner and make sure there's no grease or oil up in this area because the handle skills are going to come up to right here. Just to make sure that every area of the epoxy is going to be, has a every chance it can to bond well. You want to make sure you don't get up into this finished area with grinding the tang or cleaning the tang on the grinder, obviously. And aside from that, it's ready to go, so I'm wearing gloves, so don't, partly to keep epoxy off my hands, but also to keep oils off of the material. So that's important, so I'm going to set this carefully away from anywhere that it'll get dirty, hopefully. So I'm going to use this little card, an old business card actually, to mix up my epoxy. Now I can't say I recommend it little plastic cups would be much better and the only reason I'm not using that is because I haven't got around to ordering some um, so so that combined with wearing gloves like these it's probably the biggest two biggest pieces of advice for working with epoxy that I have personally found make it a lot easier or in the case of the part that I don't have would make it a lot easier so sometimes people ask me what sort of epoxy to use or what kind do I use and honestly the short answer is um, what's more important in my opinion than the type of epoxy you use is the prep, is the preparation uh, of the tang of the knife, of the handle material, all of that, you know, mixing the epoxy thoroughly, all these little different things that go into to um, making a nice tight strong build you know if you if you do if you neglect some of these things you know if, if the knife tang is still got scale on it excessively or it's uh, greasy or whatever and different things like that and you use a really expensive epoxy it's not you know I mean the knife handle might not fall apart but it's not really gonna matter as much as it it's not going to matter that you're using their super expensive stuff because it's not able to do its job. It's not able to reach its full potential. And so what I use is the DevCon um, two-ton epoxy. And then, of course, epoxy is not the only thing that's holding these handle skills onto the knife. You're using it in conjunction with either bolts or pins of some style or type. And so understanding how those work together is also is also important. So I'm putting a little epoxy into the countersink there just so that it's full, it's filled up and it's going to lock that bolt in um, and, and not allow any kind of moisture to get in there. Honestly with bolts like these and, and the loveless bolts that I use a lot of. Um, so you can see I still have my I have my whole handle material package put together in the same way it was when I did all those operations to it. So everything is indexed properly. So holding it like this, I know that this needs to now go on here like so. Um, pretty simple, just keeping everything lined up. And maybe it's a little simpler after you've done it a few times, but um, that's how this is gonna go. And then we're gonna put a layer of epoxy on the uh, liners here. Relatively simple operation. keeping everything in the spot that it belongs.
you know, after you've tightened down the bolts, there's really very little epoxy left uh, in, in the whole handle construction, but, you know, honestly one of the biggest and most important things that this epoxy will do in this particular handle construction where the bolts are really playing the biggest part uh, it's, is, is that it's going to make sure moisture doesn't get down in between or in anything. And I'll just, I got some extra here, so I'll just put it on the surface of the handle material on here, even though it's going to, I already got plenty on there, but never mind. So there's different lengths of Corby bolts. These are one inch, and if you're using really thick handle material, or really thick tang or something like that, you might want the uh, one and an eighth inch. But honestly, I find the uh, the one inch to be adequate for anything I've done so far. And at times, I've had to uh, cut down the one and an eighth inch bolts if I'm, you know, if I'm making something with a thinner tang like 330 seconds or something like that. So you have to pay attention to the, the, the depths, the lengths of everything, you know, how deep your um, countersinks are and, uh, you know, because you don't want your Corby bolts to bottom out, if you will, before they have pulled that handle material tight against the tang. So that's an important consideration. So like I say, for, mo for pretty much every project I've ever done, I would use an, an inch the one inch Corby bolts and that's always worked for me and, and um, so but but the other side of it too is that you got to make sure that you have you know adequate thread purchase on the bolt as well you know you don't want just one or two threads holding holding the bolt together that's not going to allow the bolt to do as do what it could and so as you can see on these there's multiple threads you know I don't know five or six even at least. So I'm just going to tighten tighten that down, uh, hand tight like that. Nothing super crazy. Um, just real snug, I guess. And sometimes as that epoxy squeezes out, um, you know, you'll have to kind of come back in a, a couple seconds later and just snug that again. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make it too tight. Just as long as it's snug and it's doing doing what it's supposed to do and uh, it is there now so you know you can throw a clamp on this middle here sometimes I do that not really necessary in my experience um, maybe a little extra peace of mind but the next thing we have to do that's important is to clean off the epoxy that is squeezed out up here because once again we can't do anything with that um, aside from wiping the epoxy out before it sets. And so that's that's crucial. So that's what I'm going to do here, and this rig is kind of dirty. What I like to do is I like to go ahead and get my WD-40, spray a little bit on a rig, and once I've wiped most of the excess epoxy off of this area, I'll just come back with the WD-40 and just hit it again, what that does is really helps just clean it off, but also, um, you know, keeps it from, keeps the epoxy from adhering to these surfaces right here, even if there is a little bit, a little bit left. Sometimes you'll have to watch and make sure that more epoxy doesn't squeeze out slowly, and this is particularly true in cooler temperatures when the epoxy is thicker or more viscous and takes longer to to squeeze out of the different areas in the in the uh, blade or excuse me the handle setup but it looks like it's warm enough today that the epoxy's done squeezing out so I think we're good and then the next thing that I like to do is just put a tiny bit of WD-40 right there um, that's gonna just run right along that seam, if you will, that juncture of the handle material and the blade. Just in case any were to squeeze out a little bit more and it just kind of keeps things good. I don't want to put a lot on there, but uh, just a little bit. So 
there we go that's ready to set up and we'll just let it cure and I'll let it cure overnight. In this case with these bolts I could get away with working on it much sooner than I would want to for example with pins but nevertheless it's you know just let it do its thing. Eight hour cure time is is what you really want to do on this and so for me most of the time that means putting the handle on one day and then shaping it the next. You know if you wanted to put it on early in the morning and then by afternoon or late afternoon or whatever you could go ahead and finish the handle and that'd be fine but we'll just let this set up overnight. The other thing that's important to point out with epoxy is that it's not glue, uh, so it's not drying as it were. Uh, I think I think it's accurate to say that it's a it's a chemical reaction, you know, with the two with the two part epoxy here, and obviously they don't set up or do what they're supposed to do until they're combined and mixed adequately. So uh, that being the case, it is temperature sensitive, and this time of year, now around here anyway. Um, the temperature is just fine, you know, I think it's going to get up to 85 degrees today, and that's, that's fine. Um, in the winter, or the fall, or the spring around here, that is a consideration, because I think, you know, once you get down to 50 or 60 degrees or below, the, the curing process on the epoxy really suffers and drops off, and of course, when, if it's freezing out, it'll, it'll, it'll be very thick, you know, because of the cold temperatures, but it won't be curing. What I do in that case is... Oftentimes I'll either bring it in the house in a cardboard box or whatever so to warmer temperatures where it can cure, or I'll use my toaster oven just on a warm setting uh, to put you know one or two blades in there. And um, the timer on that runs for an hour, you know, so sometimes I'll turn it on a couple times, but that, that really helps get it set up and then uh, allow the curing process to go a lot better. All right, guys, well, that's it for today for the blade shop. Appreciate you being here, as always, uh, the support. I'm going to go ahead and repeat the process more or less on uh, those other knives that I showed you and uh, get some handles put on. Keep plugging away, so we'll see you on the next video.